my talk today is writing better jQuery infused JavaScript. So, little jQuery humor to start things off. So, if we come over here to Meta Stack Exchange, you know, when is use jQuery not a valid answer to a JavaScript question? We scroll down here for a little ways. Um, so, yeah. So, when you're trying to reboot the system to get the electric fences back on. Yeah. So seriously, even jQuery knows better than to shut down the raptor fences. And we've got the whole, you know, you might not need jQuery. So it's like instead of doing this, oh, you just need to do that. OK, that's cool. Thanks. You know, some of these are a little bit nicer than others. That's a cool, fun website. And then you have, you know, the obligatory, you know, exhibit, you know, yo, dog, I heard you like jQuery deferred. So I promise. <laughs> right? Because jQuery. And I think I have one more potentially lame joke queued up here. Or maybe I don't. Or maybe my spinning Rust laptop. So how to use jQuery without making a mess? Naturally, this question was closed. Naturally, it was downvoted twice. So apparently, it may or may not even be possible. Nobody's sure. And nobody's really interested in the answer, apparently, because the question was downvoted. But yeah. So my name is Ken Dale. You can find me on Twitter and all the other various internet places at Ken Dale IV. IV, because I'm the fourth. Crazy. So kind of getting right into the meat of the talk. So the goal of the talk is to be able to take this code here and just make it better. So. Now that you've kind of seen a snapshot of the code, I'm going to kind of go over and show you what it does. And hopefully, the internet will be kind to me right now. So I have this very simple application where you type in a stock ticker symbol. In this case, it's pre-populated with the Microsoft for you know, MSFT. And there's a button that says Fetch. So when I click Fetch, What's happening is it's going out to Yahoo Finance. It's pulling back an XML response. It's parsing it, and it's updating the UI. So it's saying Microsoft right now is trading at 46.65, which I don't know if that's good or bad for Microsoft. I don't know how they're doing today. But it, uh, it puts it in this current area, and then it keeps a running history of all the things you've done. So if I were to put Google's ticker symbol in here, and Google's trading for a lot more than Microsoft currently. And so you can see that it updated this current area, and it kind of appended to the history. So if I were to rerun the Microsoft quote, just so you under, fully understand what's going on, when I hit Fetch again, we got Microsoft back at the current. And the history now has, oh, it's up. Or is it down? No, no, it's up. So if any of you bought in that amount of time, like you just made like four cents in you know stock profits there. So. Just some missed opportunities. It's the opportunity cost of attending this talk, apparently. So now that you kind of have an idea for what the application does, now we can kind of look at the JavaScript code that's powering it. So this is a beginner level talk, so I don't want to take anything for granted. So I'm going to kind of just walk through and kind of fully explain what's going on. Because if you don't understand this from a fundamental level, then the rest of the talk might make absolutely no sense to you. So dollar in this context, usually when you see that in JavaScript code, it's usually referring to jQuery, at least in the client side environment. There might be some server side stuff that I just don't know about. But yeah, so it's basically saying whenever the document's ready, so whenever the doc document object model has everything, all has all of its stuff together, we're going to run this code here. So we're going to wire something up to this fetch button here. So we got this button here, it has an ID of fetch. So we wire it up with a jQuery selector, which you can kind of think of as a CSS selector if you're not yet familiar with it. You know, so the pound refers to the ID of fetch. And then we call click on that guy. And when we call click, we're basically saying whenever you click on that button, we want to execute the code inside this function here. So what happens in there? Well, you can kind of look at this from an inside out perspective. So we take the stock symbol value, so that's basically the text box that you were typing in. We pull out the value, which in this case might be M, M, yeah, M or just G-O-O-G, because apparently I'm having problems with anything that starts with M right now. 
So we pull out the GOOG. If, there was, if it was all lowercase, we take it to uppercase before we send it across the wire. And we also use this jQuery.trim utility function. So if there was any trailing spaces or prepending spaces, you know we want to pull those out as well. So we get the stock symbol. We pump it into a variable. And then we call jQuery Ajax. I omitted the some long URL that is the Yahoo Finance thing. And whenever that comes back successfully, you know, so with a non HTTP error status code, we do some stuff. And that stuff is basically parsing out the response to get the last trade price. And then we update the two different things on the UI. So we update the current stock price, which is the thing we just completely pave over. And then we also append to the log. And the way you app append to the log in this case is I just call .html. And then I use the HTML to kind of be able to append additional code onto it. So that's kind of what's going on there. If we had viewed it on GitHub, just to kind of prove the point, this is the entire application that you're looking at. So it's an inline script that's just plopped on a page. There are some you know, very minimal HTML. There's no CSS. It doesn't need to look pretty. It's a demo. So yeah. So how do we, or kind of, I just want to kind of speak to the rationale here for a minute. So a lot of us, you know, are professional software developers. And you know what? If you're not a professional software developer, like, hey, that's totally fine. But a lot of us are professional developers, and we like trying to drive toward this idea of just having good, maintainable, and testable code. You know, we just heard all about like simplicity, you know, and all that. But this kind of goes into that in being able to write code that is maintainable and testable. So kind of the inherent problems with this being maintainable and testable is it's kind of got all of these mixed concerns in and of the code. So when you start thinking about the different things this is doing, it's doing stuff that interacts with the UI kind of in these two lines. It's parsing what comes back from Ajax request here. And then it's actually making an Ajax request. And all of that stuff is kind of wrapped into it. So you've got all these mixed concerns that are kind of, you know, you're kind of bouncing around. It's like you've got code that updates the UI, you've got this, you've got that other thing. And honestly, for this simple example, like, it's really not that bad in terms of a simple example. But the problem is once it comes out of the context of a simple application, you know, just a simple, you know, hey, I'm doing a talk, let's come up with something simple, that's where things can start to break down and you end up with the, you know, 4,000 lines of jQuery infused JavaScript, if you will. I mean, has, has anybody ever had that experience, whether you either wrote it or you had to go and maintain somebody else's code? And you get in there, and you're like, yeah, I know JavaScript executes top down, but this is insanity. And it's like everything you break, you know, everything you touch, you're worried about like completely annihilating everything else. So it's like you got to like walk around on eggshells inside the code base, and you know, you've got that whole notion. So how do we get away from that? You know, as our applications grow and evolve. So. And in terms of you know, warm fuzzies, a lot of us are professional developers. And at the end of the day, like, we want to do things right. It doesn't necessarily mean we always get there. Like, a lot of us start off with the best of intentions. And we have like, really great practices at the start. And then we end up start making these compromises. Sometimes it is what it is. And you know, we end up you know, creating the Rube Goldberg machine sometimes. I mean, it does happen. But you know, it's kind of just the, the you know, the why, the rationale for why you'd want to look into this. So there's some quick jQuery stuff. I'm just going to pound through these kind of specific to jQuery. So moving your JavaScript into external files. So if we looked at my code that went along with my example, which I apparently closed that browser tab, but the, the JavaScript code was all just kind of in line with the HTML. and if you're not familiar with why that's a bad practice, I mean, that's totally fine. But I'm just going to kind of give you like a few pointers that, A, whenever HTML comes over the wire, you're down, usually downloading the entire page. And what's going to happen is that JavaScript code is going to have to be pulled down and, you know, with every single one of your HTTP requests. And the web today has kind of gotten into this idea of, hey, let's make everything H H HTTPS. You know, let's be secure, have everything encrypted going over the wire. And part of that has been this whole HSTS initiative, you know, the HTTP strict transport security, which is kind of mandating HTTPS in a sense to try to keep away from man in the middle attacks. You know, there's probably all sorts of cool stuff you can look at with that. But 
part of that comes with, by default, if you enable HTTP or HSTS, that inline script stuff isn't going to work. So as the web is moving forward, I think it's important to stay with it. And you know, you want to be able to support HSTS out of the box. So hey, just get it into an external file. Plus, m probably more importantly right now, is just this whole notion of cacheability. So if you have a file that is an external JavaScript file and that's not rapidly changing, ideally the browser can cache that and it doesn't have to pull down that payload all the time. And you know, if your JavaScript is 50K and it loads on every single page load, your mobile users who have a you know, metered connection might really appreciate you not flooding their you know, bandwidth and whatnot. So just some of the quick little reasons. But it's a good practice to have and just something you should probably be doing. So strict mode. So you may or may not be familiar with this. But this is kind of like a magic string that when you run it in JavaScript, everything in the context of this function, basically strict mode converts things that you're probably shouldn't be doing. Normally, JavaScript would more than happily do them for you, but it kind of converts them to errors. So as a quick example for what that looks like, if I pop into the Chrome console, so if I do a equals test inside of a function scope, it more than happily created me a global variable named a. Ideally, this is an error. This is probably meaning that you forgot the var keyword whenever you're pounding out code. Maybe you like to do that pattern where you do a equals 1, b equals 2. And maybe you put like a semicolon or something here rather than a comma. And now you have global variables. But whenever you have strict, the use strict directive specified, if we try to create a global variable named b, we now get a reference error. So just by using use strict, you're kind of saving yourself from yourself. So it's kind of just a good habit to get into. And if you're a little confused what the syntax is, don't worry. I've got that on the next slide. So an immediately invoked function expression. It's kind of something you're going to see, in, especially in a lot of client-side code. And on the server, and maybe as things move forward with ES6 modules and other various things, this might become less important. But I think it's an important pattern for you to know and understand. So when you see it in the wild, even if you're not authoring this type of stuff, you can you know, get a feel for what's going on and why they're doing what they're doing. So the way this works, we have a standard JavaScript function. We wrap that in parens, so that turns it in. You know, We now have a function expression. And then the way we execute a function in JavaScript, and in potentially a number of other languages, is we use you know, the parens after it. So you can think of, hey, I'm taking this thing that's you know, this, just this anonymous function, and then I want to immediately execute it. So like, why would you want to do that? Mainly, you're, you're trying to save yourself from yourself, but you're also trying to save yourself from other libraries that might be polluting the global namespace. So if you have a global variable, something else has a global variable. They're both named data. You can imagine what's going to happen there whenever you're both trying to write to the same global variable in two different libraries. But you know, you're shielding yourself from others. So something you should probably be doing. And this concept is important enough that the Atom editor itself has support for this as one of those like little expando snippets, which I recently found out about this. So if we open up a JavaScript file, if I do I I F E, whack the tab key, we get one of those along with the use strict directive. Already there. So it's important enough of a concept that it made a snippet in the Atom editor. So jQuery has some shorthand for some things. One of them is the document ready. So this is basically saying whenever the DOM is fully ready to go, you know, execute my code. A lot of people write it in the shorthand, and it's something I think it's kind of the generally recommended practice. But you know what? If you wrote it the other way, I'm not going to, you know, don't think anybody's going to be super upset about it, but you should understand both of them and know that they can be used interchangeably. And they're essentially the same thing. And just some other quick little things. Just bear with me here. So rather than doing click, I like to do on and then click, which you'll kind of understand why whenever I get to the testing portion of the talk. But you know, just kind of keep this in the back of your mind. And this will also be important later. So rather than using the success callback on the jQuery AJAX object, treat it like a JavaScript promise and then call done on it. 
So then you can do all sorts of cool stuff like chaining. You know, you can call a dot fail. You can have multiple dot duns, I assume. You can have a finally. You know, you're kind of working with it in the same way as any other JavaScript promise. So just some guidance, which might become more apparent as we move down the line here. But I'd like to just get it out there up front. And kind of just generally recommended programming practice, don't use deprecated things in general because you never know when they're going to get yanked out. So avoid using things like jQuery Live that have been deprecated. So if you look on the documentation, they kind of give you the workaround when you use the document selector, and the second parameter becomes what you put in the first selector. But you, you can figure it out on the documentation. But you know, try to keep away from the, the deprecated things there. All right, so that was the easy stuff. So let's kind of move into the more difficult stuff, kind of what more of the talk, the point of the talk is. So I'm saying prepare yourself because it's about to get a little bit more complicated, but just try to stay with me. Like when I hit the next slide button, like don't freak out. Like we're all here for you. Like it's going to be okay. So I mentioned the mixing of concerns. So if we went the whole way back to that you know, second slide or whatever it was that said betterify this, you know, and it had that code example. It had all of these different mixed concerns where, you know, you're modifying the UI, you're doing stuff with data, you're doing this, you're doing that, and you're kind of just jumping around. Well, this is aiming to try to pull out some of that jumping around into just modules, components, you know, just these discrete things that we can think about independently, and then we can treat them independently. And, you know, there's lots of power that comes along with that. So unmixing those concerns, I'm not, yeah, so we'll just try to dive into this here. So instead of using jQuery Ajax done, we're going to create our own thing called a data provider. And the way I'm doing this, there's all sorts of different ways to do this. And ES6 modules might even be a superior way at this point. I'm not going to get into all that new ES6 stuff here today. but. The way I'm doing this is using Stock Retriever kind of as my global thing that will house all of my modules, components, whatever we want to call them. So the way this works is I'm basically initializing it here. So the order of these things wouldn't matter. So if I initialize data provider before some other piece, you know, I won't have a problem with you know, the ordering in that respect. So we have our data provider. Uh, and data provider itself is an object that has a method on it called get prices. And you pass that in symbols. And then I do some stuff. So this is where it's important to note that jQuery Ajax itself returns a promise. So I mentioned about the chaining of dot done and those sorts of things. Well, you can kind of take that same principle of what jQuery Ajax is doing, and you can kind of bake that into your own code. So in this case, we might return a jQuery deferred. And rather, we're actually returning the promise of the deferred. Kind of the important distinction there is if you return a promise, that basically means that the client can't do bad things to your deferred object. So it's important to do that when you're working with the jQuery deferred object. But that's kind of a minor point. Kind of the more major point here is the fact that we're doing the same thing that jQuery Ajax is doing under the hood. So it enables someone to do a dot done in the same manner that somebody's doing the dot done up here. So rather than calling jQuery Ajax and writing a URL, we kind of take all of that logic, like the how to make the request and all of that goo, and we move that into something that's the data provider here. So something might then use this data provider by calling stock retriever data provider get prices Microsoft, you know, the MSFT symbol. But it doesn't know what the URL is for Yahoo Finance. It doesn't know how to work with Yahoo Finance. Nor does it know how to parse the response that comes back for Yahoo Finance to be able to get that information. So we're, we're, we're starting to like tease apart the different pieces. So I kind of demonstrated that here for a data provider. But the way I pulled it apart, if you think back to my example application, I pulled it apart into two different discrete pieces. We kind of have the data provider, and we have the UI provider. So anything that interacts with the UI, you know, the actual what you're seeing in the browser, goes in that UI provider. And anything that's kind of more of a data concern ends up in the data provider. So you basically do what I did on the previous slide, but you kind of do the same thing for the UI provider. 
So I'm just going to show the finish point so you can kind of just see how many lines of code roughly this turns into. So this is on GitHub. All right. So you can see, you know, you remember how you know simple my example was before and that it fit on one slide? Well, in terms of lines of code, in some way this did kind of explode. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like don't look at it as, you know, oh, the, the other thing is somehow more simple, you know, and that's more better because it has less lines of code. But yeah, it works for that simple small example. And maybe that's even the right answer if that's all the application was ever meant to do and you didn't really need to test it or that sort of thing. But we're kind of thinking, you know, more in terms of the large and being able to wrangle that. So yes, the number of lines of code kind of exploded, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, don't take that as, you know, as a blow to simplicity in that sense. So yeah, we, so we've got some more code here. And in terms of, you know, I mentioned that 4,000 lines of jQuery file. So yes, JavaScript executes from the top down, but sometimes it can be a little tricky, you know, just figuring out where things are, how things work what the logic flow is going to be like inside that 4,000 lines. But ideally, you have you know, this single obvious way to make the thing work, which I think some libraries are currently doing. Like if you're writing Angular code, you, know, you have that ng app directive that's kind of like, like, hey, this is where I'm starting. You know, it's kind of this obvious starting point. But when you're writing jQuery code and you're kind of just hacking together your own thing in a sense, not necessarily like in a derogatory sense, but you know you're not you're lacking in kind of this overall framework of you know obvious expectations. It's nice to have this obvious entry point into your code. So in my case, I have stock retriever data provider, I have the UI provider, and then I just have this thing called app, which is kind of the main entry point that uses those other components as necessary. Kind of has the the top level logic in. So I just call app.init, and that's the thing that actually fires off the app and makes it work. If you don't call app.init, it's just a web page that has some controls on it and doesn't really do anything. So that kind of concludes the whole, you know, let's pull things apart. Now that you kind of have an understanding of why you'd want to do that and how you are able to pull the things apart, that also affords you the opportunity to write automated tests against your stuff. And if you're planning to write automated tests, I advise you to kind of do it along with the refactoring. Because otherwise, if you're not writing tests along with the refactoring and you plan to do them later, you might end up writing code that's actually not testable. Like you might think you're doing the right thing and that you're going to have great testable code. But then you later realize if you try to come back you know, months later and you know, author tests for it, you might find that it's not really as testable as you were hoping. So, so what's testing look like with? JavaScript. So I do a lot with .NET. I do a lot with C Sharp. And one of the things I like about the JavaScript testing story is just how simple it is and how little just language cruft, if you will. You know, whenever I do stuff with C Sharp, I end up doing stuff in XUnit that looks like fact, public, void, you know, my test method. I have some parens. I have curly braces, and all of this is just, you know, stuff. And then if I'm testing something asynchronous, I might have something like that in C sharp. And it's like there's just all of this overhead that's not really part of your testing story. But JavaScript, at least with Jasmine, because of the dynamic nature of the language, it just affords you opportunities to just minimize a lot of that. So it here is something that's provided by the Jasmine library. So that's kind of how you define a test. You just do it. Then you pass in a magic string that describes what your test is. It can be whatever you want. It will just show up on the test runner, but it has no bearing on your actual test execution. And then you pass it in a function that actually contains your test stuff. So in this case, I'm kind of writing a smoke test. So the expect and to be, they're provided by Jasmine as well. And in this case, I expect true to be true. So if this test ever fails, either your laptop needs to be like immediately thrown into a lake, or there's something wrong with Jasmine, or there's like some crazy JavaScript bug that you encountered at that specific instance in time with your specific config. Yeah, so you, you get my point there. But 
Smoke tests are something that are good to have. So if you're working with a new testing library, or if this is your first time you know, dipping into testing, you probably want to write something like this, and then maybe even change this to fail, you know, change it to be false rather than true, and kind of see what a failure looks like in the context of your test runner, you know, just to make sure everything's working. So my test runner for this is just the HTML Jasmine runner. So if I run this guy, run some tests. So I've got 17 specs, and thankfully none of them failed, because that wouldn't be good. So we can see I've got data provider, should return single price, should return multiple prices. I've got all sorts of lovely tests for this simple little application here. Back to the slides. So it's, I'm just pointing out that you know Jasmine is this really simple just library and way and paradigm of testing. And yeah, there's probably all sorts of different libraries in some of them. There probably a lot of them are pretty similar. But hey, I'm not saying you could use Jasmine, but I like it and I seem to have success with it, at least in the context of this talk. So that's what we're going with here. And something that is a little more tricky with JavaScript testing, you know, before I was able to just plow through this test because there's nothing async happening here. You know, it's everything can be handled without having this whole nature of callbacks and having to wait on that stuff and potentially even waiting on a network request if it's more of a unit test or in that case, it might actually be an integration test if it's going out to Yahoo Finance and doing anything there. But in order to write an async test, you know, things get a little bit more difficult, but it's not terrible. Like the way Jasmine handles it in this context, like I think it's actually a pretty neat way they do it. So this test is basically saying that the data provider should return a single price. So I have a data provider called get prices for the Microsoft stock symbol. And I do stuff whenever that comes back. And that stuff is where I'm basically figuring out, hey, did it do the right thing whenever it called data provider get prices? Did I get back what I expected from that method? So I expect the item symbol. So basically, the first thing in the response that comes back, I expect the symbol to be Microsoft because, hey, I asked for Microsoft. If it gave me back Google stock symbol, clearly I know I have a bug. Maybe I had something hard coded in get prices that I forgot to pull out. You know, while I was testing something, but you know, this automated test would pick up on that. And I also expect the last trade price is a decimal number. So basically, did I get back a not a number, or negative infinity, or something crazy, or did I get undefined is not a function, or whatever other JavaScript jokes I can insert there? So after that's done, then I call this spec done. So anything, you can call this whatever you want. Spec done seems like an appropriate name, but you could call it cheese pizza if you wanted to. So we call the spec done there inside of the done. So what's happening here is it's actually going in, it's going across the wire, you know, making that Ajax request, pulling back the data, and then at some point it will call the spec done. And that's signaling to Jasmine that, hey, your test is actually completed at this point. Because without that, it's kind of just guessing. Because it doesn't know if the thing's ever going to come back. It doesn't know how long to wait. It doesn't know if it's going to complete. And if it never completes, Jasmine has a way of handling that. By default, I'm not sure if it's a three second timeout, but there is some sort of default timeout that if your thing just runs forever, that Jasmine will pick up on that and just count that as a failing test. I'm not sure. It might be even be a configurable thing, but it does have that kind of as a default option. And kind of going back to the whole, you know, we can think of Java and C Sharp kind of as the more heavy languages by comparison. But so to be a decimal number is not something that's provided by Jasmine. That's something I actually created all on my own. And I created it in such a way that it feels like this first class thing, which I think is really powerful. Like if I was creating a chess application, I might be able to have one to be like, you know, that kind of speaks the language of chess rather than, than speaking the language of programming, you know, that I can kind of model things after, you know, what I'm doing. So maybe if it was, you know, some sort of like, you know, game, maybe it would be like, you know, I expect, you know, that hit points would go down, you know, and then you could provide a, a number for that, for instance. So yeah, so what does this look like to be able to construct one of these guys? And honestly, it looks kind of scary. 
This is something you just grab off documentation. The important points here are there's the thing, the to be a decimal number, and here's where you determine whether it's true or false. The rest of the stuff, just go to documentation, but that's how you're able to construct one of those. But I thought I'd mention it. So something else that can be kind of more difficult in other languages, but JavaScript makes it fun and easy, is just this whole notion of mocking. So with JavaScript, because of the dynamic nature and be able to rewrite anything, which you know, so somebody comes along and decides undefined is now going to be defined, you know, because of that whole nature of JavaScript, it enables you to do some pretty cool scenarios with regards, of with regards to testing just because you're paving over things. So in this context, I say it should create click handler on fetch button selector. So I grab the fetch button selector. And then I'm spying on the fetch button on method. So if you remember back whenever I was saying, you know, use on rather than click, if you were using click, click would go there rather than the on keyword. So I'm saying that I want you to spy on this thing, Jasmine, because I want to be able to figure out whether it was actually invoked, because that's what I want to check, whether that thing is actually fired. So then I call my app.init, which is the global top level starting point of the application that I mentioned earlier. And after I call that, I expect the fetch button on to have been called with, which is something that's provided by Jasmine. And then I expect it to be called with these parameters. So click and then app.fetch here, which app.fetch is kind of the function that goes along with that, I believe. So if we were using the click handler rather than the on, or the click, the click method rather than the on method, we'd have to change it here, and we'd have to change it here, and then we'd have to pull this out. Whereas if we just use the on, then it gives us a single place to change it. So that's kind of the, you know, whenever I was saying, you know, put a pin on that, you know, we'll come back later. That's kind of the, the rationale for doing that. So different people have different opinions as to what you do with your test code. So who here has heard of the, the whole dry or know what that means? So yeah, so basically dry is don't repeat yourself. So th what that means in the context of programming, and don't repeat yourself basically means you don't take that same utility function and copy paste it in 18 different places in your application. Ideally, you have it the one single representation and then you, you know, reference that where you need to. So does anybody know what the opposite of dry is? Yeah, it's wet. You know what wet stands for? We enjoy typing. Yeah. So, yeah. So in here, in terms of drying the test code, if we just come down the whole way here, we see that I have all of these its. So these are the actual tests. But if you look at them, each one of them is just the actual assertion. So if you're thinking in terms of the range act assert pattern, you know, all we're doing is verifying the stuff, but we don't actually seeing any, we're not seeing anything actually getting set up here. You know, so it's I expect get symbol to have been called, but like, well, what happened there that, you know, that this is even a valid test assertion? So, you know, we do this four different times, testing four different things. But I decided to pull everything into this before each. So in terms of the before each, basically this gets fired independently for each one of those tests down below. So you can kind of think of your test code, you know, you can pull out all those duplicate things and you can kind of move them into the before each. And honestly, there's different schools of thought in terms of test code. Some people actually like the idea of having the duplication in the test code because it can make things a little more clear. And I don't necessarily have like this hard and fast view in one or the other camps. But the way I kind of lean is if I'm kind of on the fence and I'm not sure you know, whether I want to have the duplication or whether I want to pull it out, usually I fall on the side of you know, having less duplication. That's kind of where I fall. But you know, if you have your own convictions on the matter, you know, as long as you understand both sides, like, hey, you can make an informed decision there. So before each of those, we use the Jasmine spy on, which is basically the, you know, the Jasmine mocking stuff. So I say the data provider get prices method, 
and call fake. So what's actually happening is I'm actually paving over the implementation as well as listening for what's happening on that. So rather than actually going out to Yahoo Finance and making the actual network call, I'm basically paving over it with my own implementation that just returns stuff immediately. So you know, if I'm testing something that doesn't actually need to rely on Yahoo Finance in the context of my application, like, hey, let's just mock that out and just return it immediately. Because I'm guessing if you hit Yahoo Finance enough in rapid succession, they might get kind of angry. Maybe their server will not like you very much, and then all of your t tests might start failing. So this is one way to get around that. Plus, it will increase the speed of your test runs. You know, if you're doing test-driven development, you know, having fast executing tests is always a good thing. So we also have some other stuff that we want to set up. And then this is the thing I'm actually testing, like the app.fetch. So does the app.fetch, does it do this? Does it do this? And the other two. And now I need to refresh because I messed up Reveal.js. All right. So yeah, uh, at this point, I kind of want to take the, just kind of take a step back in terms of just recognizing the fact that the stuff isn't necessarily the most easy and straightforward thing you're going to do. But I think it's important, like if you want to progress to that next level, like I think it's just something you need to dig into. But honestly, like this is non-trivial, taking it from where we started to where we are now. Like it's actually gonna, you know, it's gonna require a little bit of work, like in understanding, you know, JavaScript promises and deferred objects and that sort of thing, to be able to wrap things like jQuery Ajax in order to make this. So, you know, if you're having a little bit of problem up front, like I think that's a normal thing. And you know, you just need to just work through that barrier, and at the end of it, you know, you'll be able to ideally do these kinds of things. So, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing good. So, there are other ways to modularize. I use the pattern of you know the kind of that namespace pattern where I had the stock retriever, but you know, ES6 modules are around. Those look pretty cool. You know, there's AMD, there's Common JS. I'm not necessarily saying one's better than the other. But for the context of this talk, I didn't want to get into a lot of the JavaScript ecosystem and just JavaScript things. Like I wanted to just stick with straight HTML, JavaScript, and jQuery. But if you're interested, those other ways of doing things might be superior and may have less boilerplate code than what I authored here today. But you know, ideally, just strive towards simplicity. And I think ES6 modules might be the way forward. I don't know, but it looks pretty cool. So. But you know, this uses you know manual dependency ordering in terms of having that the top level application being run after the other things are wired up. And you know what? For a simple app like this, it's probably okay. So kind of give you just a final snapshot into my code here. So here's where we started. So we started with this block of code here. And if you look on line 28 here, this is the, oh, come on, GitHub. There we go. Or come on, my machine, rather. So that was the big, scary URL that I'm creating to hit Yahoo Finance, if you're interested. But you know, this is the entire web page of code that is the existing starting example application. Like The whole entire thing, including JavaScript and HTML, is 44 lines of code. That even includes a blank line on line number 2 and 12. And yeah, you get the point. But now the HTML looks like this. So it's, I assume it's probably the same. But instead of our JavaScript code just pumped here, I moved it into a separate file called main.js. And then that main.js file you know, did kind of explode in lines of code. But sometimes there is that you know, just extra code that's necessary as you pull things out, because things are now independent. But hey, now they're more testable. and. You know, and you get you get the warm fuzzies whenever you're working with the code base, as opposed to the I can't believe I'm working with this 4,000 line file of jQuery all over again. So, you know, you can pull this code down, examine it. It's all up on GitHub along with the presentation, and just kind of give you a look into what the specs look like as well. You know, so I got my smoke test here that I talked about. So I expect true to be true, and then I've got all sorts of different tests that go along with this, which you can also play around with as well if you want to you know, look into this further. 
yeah. So I've got all these tests and just using the Jasmine HTML runner. So every time I hit F5, just running the tests. And they, they run like that. And you know, if you are rapidly iterating on your stuff, if you come in and you broke something, you know, you'd be able to see that very quickly. So just to demonstrate actually breaking something, just fire up the old Atom editor here. So if we change this true to be false, that's what a failure looks like in the Jasmine you know, thing. So expects true to be false. So yeah, that's definitely a problem. So, so that's kind of what I have. And at this point, I'll just open it up for questions. But you know, here's the URL to the repo, you know, to the actual code. And if you want to see the the repo kind of works in the sense that the commit history is kind of the path forward. So if you go back to the first commit, that's my starting point. And then the latest commit is kind of where I am today in terms of you know, pulling it apart and testing it. So if you kind of want to see what it looks like to go through all of those different iterations, rather than just going straight from start to straight to finish, like you can kind of see that iteration on the repo you know, yourself independently. And then the presentation is in the gh-pages branch. But that's what I got. I'm Ken Dale at Ken Dale IV on Twitter. So at this point, I'll just open it up to any questions if y'all have any. Thank you. Okay. So the, the question is about pulling out the configuration of the application, specifically in regards to the selectors. So if we pop over to the code here, the way I pulled this out, and I'm not saying it's the best way of doing things, but it's the way I did it is so I have the UI provider here, which itself is an object. I have an object on here called configuration. Inside there is an object called selectors. And then I literally just put the jQuery selectors themselves there. You know, there's probably different ways to do that. There might be better patterns in terms of using like underscore defaults or various other patterns, but you know, this one's at least breaking it up into, you know, an obvious thing. And I believe if you search for configuration throughout this, you know, I, I kind of use that pattern throughout. So I've got configuration for the selectors for the fetch button here. And that might be the only one. But yeah, but I'm just being consistent throughout. I'm not saying it's the absolute best way to do things, but yeah. Hopefully that answered your question. Ooh. So the question is around best practices. You know, I went back to the whole, or going back to the whole like jQuery shorthand stuff. So if I were to fly through my slides, you know, about using the various types of shorthand and just around best practices with working with jQuery, I don't have any resources right off the top of my head that I can think of that are like, these are the jQuery best practices. There's probably something out there. I'm just not familiar with it. I mean, we can connect after the talk and we can try to find something, but I don't have something like lock load or ready to go to give you, unfortunately. And I guess by the sound of the sirens, I guess that means my talk is over. So hey, thank you very much. And